as a probe of unconventional superconductors, and I illustrated uh, this on cuprates and iron-based superconductors. So concerning iron-based superconductors, I didn't have time to talk about the superconducting state, so if somebody has questions, I can answer them later on. But for the second part of the lecture, I want to switch a little bit of subject. I want to talk about the Higgs mode in superconductors and essentially how to detect it. So this is going to involve some Raman measurements, but I'm going also to, to dwell a bit on how it can couple to terahertz light in uh, time domain measurements. Okay, so first, an introduction to the Higgs mode in superconductors. So um, as you have seen in, uh, in the first lectures, you can describe your superconductor in terms of a Landau functional. And this is very general, right? So you have this Mexican hat potential. And once you look at this uh, Mexican hat potential, the ground state is sitting at the, at the bottom here. And you can have, from a very general uh, point of view, uh, two kinds of collective excitation. One that will involve the phase of the superconducting order parameter, and the other one that will involve its amplitude. Now, this has been worked out actually uh, in the 60s by various people, and what you can show is that if the superfluid is neutral, let's say, for example, like helium superfluid, the phase mode is linearly dispersing as a function of momentum, and the amplitude mode is gapped and it's gapped by an amount which is twice the superconducting gap. Now, if you are in a charge system, actually the phase mode uh, couples to the Coulomb interaction and is pushed to the plasma energy. This is the so-called Anderson Higgs mechanism, so it's essentially irrelevant in superconductors. It's just the plasma frequency. Now, the amplitude mode stays, and actually in that case, you can show that uh, this amplitude mode, in the case of a superconductor, has a strong analogy with the Higgs mode of the standard model. And essentially, to make a, a, a long story short, the idea is that in Lorentz invariant system, so in our case, the Lorentz invariance in the superconductors, in the superconductors is associated to the fact that there is some inherent particle hole symmetry in the superconducting state. The Higgs is a true collective mode in the sense that it's decoupled from the phase mode. Now, of course, um, what you see here is that uh, in this simple cartoon picture, the Higgs mode is sitting right at 2 delta. And as you know from the previous lecture, at the 2 delta, it's also the boundary of the, elect of the, the Cooper pair breaking continuum. So it's sitting right at the threshold of a continuum. So it's expected to be damped. Now, um, there has been just briefly that to mention that uh, apart from superconductors, uh, there has been uh, observation of such uh, an amplitude mode, or at least fingerprint of it, in other systems. Uh, the idea is that uh, in order to observe really this excitation, you must have some approximate Lorentz invariance, and this can be achieved, for example, in, in a cold uh, atom gas, uh, where you can show that in a in some limit of the Coulomb interaction potential, you can go through a quantum critical point from a mode phase to a superfluid phase. And close to this quantum critical point, there is such a symmetry. And near this quantum critical point, you can see excitations that look like this, this Higgs mode. Now, what I want to briefly comment is how to actually probe uh, this mode. Um, so this mode is actually uh, not trivial to probe because it doesn't carry any charge nor any spin. So it actually relatively, it, it weakly couples to external probe. So I'm going to illustrate this uh, using uh, the formalism of uh, BCS theory and introducing uh, Anderson pseudospin. So the Anderson pseudospin sigma is written this way. So it's essentially the Pauli matrices uh, contracted by the superconducting wave function written in Nambu space, so in a C dagger uh, up, uh, C down. Now you can write down actually your BCS Hamiltonian just in terms of this Anderson pseudospin. And this 
uh, form of the BCS Hamiltonian takes a relatively, a remarkably compact form where you have this Anderson pseudo spin here, sigma k, that couples to an effective field. And this effective field is a three component vector. The first two components are essentially the imaginary and real part of the uh, superconducting uh, gap. So if you take, for example, the superconducting gap to be real, one of them would be zero. And uh, the third component will include uh, the dispersion. And if you introduce the coupling between light and the superconductor in a, using the prior substitution, uh, this will be the sum of, of a psi k minus Ea plus psi k plus Ea. So this is how, in this formalism, if you want a light uh, coupled to this pseudo spin. Now, uh, how do you interpret uh, this pseudo spin? So if you look, for example, at the z component of the pseudo spin, uh, you can write it in this way. And what you can see is that the z component of this Anderson pseudo spin is either minus one, minus one half or plus one half, depending whether the plus k and minus k states are occupied or not. So if you want, maybe the simplest is to start with a normal metal at t equals zero. When you are below kf, they are occupied, so you have spin one half. And when you are above kf, those are unoccupied, so you have spin minus one half. Now in the superconducting state, you have actually a mix of these two states, so that you have, if you want, the spin state uh, uh, orientation that are neither, that are combination of this plus half minus one half state. So if you want, if you want to rethink of the BCS wave function in terms of this Anderson pseudo spin, the BCF wave function will be a linear combination of the up and down spin with UKs and VKs as the prefactors. Okay, so right now this is just a rewriting of the, the BCS Hamiltonian. Now, what is uh, sort of nice in this picture is now you can have sort of an intuitive uh, picture of how this, uh, of the BCS ground state is going to evolve once you uh, couple it to light. So you can think of it as a Bloch equations where the dynamic of this pseudo spin is going to follow this Bloch equation where the Anderson pseudo spins are going to be coupled to this uh, effective field, BK. The orientation of the effective field uh, will be given uh, by the superconducting gap here, but also by the value of the vector potential of light. So that you will have a complex dynamic where the, essentially the pseudo spins are going to rotate around this effective field, and the orientation of this effective field is going to depend on K. And the resulting gap uh, dynamics is going to be the sum over all the k of the x and y component of, of this pseudo spin. And this is, of course, has to be, a self has to be sort of self consistently because both sigma k and bk depend on the superconducting gap. Now, what is interesting in this picture is that if you look at this effective field, and in particular the z component, which represents the coupling to light, you can expand it. And what you see is that once, if you write down explicitly what this uh, term gives you, uh, you can see that there is actually no coupling to linear order in A, and that the next order comes with A squared. So what this shows you is that uh, when you couple light to this pseudo spin, there is actually no term uh, that couples linearly uh, to it, to the gap dynamics, and then the only term that comes goes to A squared. So light enters the z component of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the effective magnetic field only up to order A squared. So this is another way of saying that actually there is actually very weak uh, coupling between light and the motion of this, uh, of this Anderson pseudo spin, so to speak, and so to the Higgs mode. Okay, so now uh, I will, I'm going to show you an uh, attempt uh, to uh, probe uh, this uh, Higgs dynamics, um, essentially using two uh, lines of uh, reasoning. One is, uh, so I'm going to go in historical order. First, I'm going to show you that in a situation where superconductivity coexists with a charge on CD wave state, uh, 
there is actually an indirect coupling between the Higgs mode and the charge on CD wave state that is going to make this uh, mode active in the Raman measurement. And in the second part, I'm going to show you uh, another way of pouring these Higgs dynamics directly, uh, not necessarily in cases where superconductivity coexists with charge on CD wave order. So first, let me start with uh, uh, the case where uh, super, yes. So I think if there is disorder, there, yeah. So the question was, uh, if there is disorder, what happens to this, uh, to this coupling? So I think if there is disorder, the phase and amplitude start to mix, and then you can couple, yeah. So I think this has been studied for example by Lara and Fato in, uh, in some systems, yeah. Okay, so let me first start with niobium uh, disenei. So this is a charge on CD wave superconductor. Uh, the charge on CD wave transition happens at around 40 Kelvin. It, it's barely visible here on this resistivity curve. And then it undergoes a superconducting transition at about uh, 7 Kelvin. Now, the, the charge on CD wave is a slightly incommensurate and orders along three different uh, directions oriented by uh, one, one, 120 degrees. So it's still an argument in this system about the respective importance of Fermi surface nesting and electron phonon coupling as to the main driver of the charge on CD wave state. And there is still a debate about the exact interplay between charge on CD wave and CDW gap. But what I'm going to show, to focus on is, uh, so of course, uh, this is a simple picture of the, the charge on CD wave gap opening. So this is exactly the same picture as the one I showed you for the spin on CD wave gap, you have a new periodicity and backfolding and opening of gaps at specific point of the Brillouin zone. But now I'm not going to focus on this, if you're on single particle excitation, I'm going to, to focus on collective excitation. So just like I showed you in the case of a superconductor, you can define an order parameter of the charge on CD wave. In that case, it will be the modulation of the charge density that I showed here. And you can have both, uh, so the comp this other parameter would have in general a phase and an amplitude, and you can have excitation that will involve the amplitude and the phase of this other parameter. So uh, the amplitude is going to be called the amplitude on, or the charge on CD wave amplitude mode. And this is essentially a modulation of the, of the charge on CD wave. So if electrons are coupled to the lattice, uh, to this modulation of the electron density will correspond to an atomic displacement. So this will be essentially a, a hybrid excitation between electrons and phonon. It will be a phonon-like excitation. And uh, well, if you tune the phase, uh, here you will have the phase mode, and this phase mode is, is gapless. So the amplitude has a gap, and the phase mode is gapless in the, in the case of, uh, of a clean charge on CD wave system. So you may say, well, th this is the Higgs mode also. Now, this is an amplitude mode of an order parameter, but it, the analogy with the Higgs mode is less direct than in the case of a superconductor because in the charge on CD wave state, there is no guarantee that particle hole symmetry is preserved. In fact, in general, it's not. So the analogy with the Higgs mode does not really exist in that case. But the key point is that this Amplitude mode here uh, can be Raman active, so it can be directly seen in, in the Raman measurements. So here I show you uh, Raman spectra uh, as a function of temperature, and what you see is that when you cool down below the charge anti wave transition, there is a new mode that appears, it's a relatively sharp mode, and this new mode corresponds to a phonon like, ex yes. I think, in general, they do not mix. Probably in the presence of disorder, again, they would mix. But in the clean system, they do not mix. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. So the, in the case of niobium diselenide, the, the CDW gap 
is not clearly observed in this uh, endangered diselenide, but there is another compound, uh, thallium diselenide, where we can really nicely see the, super the CDW gap and the amplitude mode is inside it. So from that point of view, it would be um, not damped, but of course, uh, nesting is never perfect, so you will always have a residual Fermi surface, so you expect in general some damping of it. Yeah. Yes? It's not the gap, yeah. Yeah, so that's, I think that's a, that's a good question. So, um, so the problem is the, there are two other measurements of the gap. You have photo emission measurements and you have STM measurements, and they give vastly different energy scales for these gaps. So the STM measurements give gaps of uh, several tens of millivolts, so much higher than this energy. But there are also some photo emission measurements which show smaller gaps, which are on the order of this. Now, I would, yeah. Now, if I go now, uh, we have recent measurements on a 2H thallium diselenide where we actually see the gap, and the gap is at much higher energy. So, and the gap is very broad, so we believe that, uh, and we see the amplitude mode, it's well inside the gap, so we believe that by comparing with naivium diselenide, we believe this is the, the, the amplitude mode. Okay, so what happens, and uh, historically this was the first time uh, the coupling to the Higgs mode in the superconductor was evoked, was that when you cool down below TC, and this is a sort of the first uh, measurements where we, you could actually see the signal, the Raman signal from a superconducting phase, this was on niobium diselenide, so 1980 by uh, Suryakuma and Klein. When you cool down below TC, so this is the amplitude mode of the CDW phase that I showed you previously, and you have right below in energy this, this amplitude mode of the charge on CD wave phase, you have the emergence of a sharp peak, which could be interpreted as a superconducting gap energy to delta. Now, what is uh, striking about this uh, superconducting mode is the way it interplays with the charge on CD wave mode, and this is most uh, easily seen by doing a careful temperature-dependent measurement across the superconducting transition temperature. And what you see is that essentially when you cool down below TC, it looks as if this mode here at low energy, the superconducting induced mode, is stealing spectral weight from the amplitude mode of the charge on CD wave phase. So there seems to be an intimate link uh, between this, uh, these two excitations. And this is actually also seen, and this was first seen actually as a function of magnetic field. So the same thing happens as a function of magnetic field. So this, yes. So that's one scenario. So one, one scenario, so if you were to follow the idea that um, this mode here, for example, is the CDW gap, that could be a sign that could be interpreted as a sign of competition, yes. Now, we believe, based on the comparison with this sister compound thallium diselenide, that this is actually the amplitude mode and not the gap. But that could, in principle, be a possible scenario. But at that time, um, this was not the scenario that was uh, put forward. The scenario that was put forward was, was the one that there is actually a coupling between the amplitude mode of the charge on CD wave phase and the amplitude mode of the superconducting phase, in other words, the Higgs mode. And this was the scenario proposed by Littlewood and Varma. So this is a PRB paper of uh, 1982, so quite right after the first uh, experimental measurements. And what they propose here, so I'm extracting an excerpt from this, uh, from this paper. So keeping in mind that U0, so U0 is the lattice distortion associated to the charge on CD wave mode, coupled to the BCS gap. So the way it is coupled was presumably thought that uh, this distortion, by distorting the lattice, modulate the Fermi, the density of state at the Fermi energy, and by modifying the density of state of the Fermi energy is also modifying the gap. So, but at that time in this paper, it was really a phenomenological coupling between, between the two. Uh, we produce a time-dependent modulation of delta. Thus, the electron phonon coupling for this mode will be of the form, and you see they propose this uh, coupling. So G is really a phenomenological coupling between here, this operator, which are the bosonic operator of this uh, charge on C wave phonon, and uh, the BCS uh, gap function. So this was proposed, and they could actually, so this is sort of the picture. So you modulate your charge on CD wave, 
And by modulating your charge density wave, you are modulating the gap. And this is the way uh, these two other parameter oscillations uh, are, are coming. So in this scenario, the, yes. Yeah, you can think of it as an optical funnel. No, so there is a, okay, so there is a related effect. Um, so there, okay, so there are some constraints to, to this coupling. First, you need to have uh, a, a coupling uh, that is strong enough, and this is usually achieved when the two mode energy are close enough in energy. And then, uh, the other thing is you need to have a phonon that strongly modulates uh, your gap. And this was presumed to be the case in, a, in, a, in this charge on CD wave superconductor. But you, you're right that, in fact, you, you have a very similar coupling uh, between the uh, phonon and the, and the superconducting cell, but instead of having tau 1 here, you would have tau 3. And uh, this would be a more regular electron phonon coupling effect. In fact, this is a very special uh, electron phonon coupling effect, and the question is how to derive this, uh, this, uh, this coupling constant. And this was done actually uh, one year after by Brown and Levin, who derived a microscopic mechanism, a microscopic picture of this, of this, of this coupling constant. But in the, in, the, in the paper of Littlewood and Varma, this was taken as phenomenological. Okay, so the idea in this scenario is that the Higgs mode would appear as a sort of a sideband of the amplitude mode of the charge on CD wave uh, phonon, essentially. So this is the, the calculation in that paper. So uh, they calculate the phonon spectral function. And by coupling it to the Higgs mode of the superconductor, the phonon spectral function acquires a new pole. And this new pole will generically appear below to delta. So that, that is good, because that, we, that is going to render it more long-lived. And those are calculations for varying uh, coupling constant. You can see here this feature is the amplitude mode of the charge on CD wave uh, uh, state. And once you cool down uh, below TC, there is a very sharp mode, which in this theory is a delta function. And when you crank up the, the, the coupling uh, constant, this goes more and more below to delta. So they actually derived uh, uh, an energy for this, uh, this coupled excitations. And it's always sitting below uh, to delta. So the fact that it's below to delta is good. It means it's going to be less damped than, than the conventional Higgs mode. Um, it's unaffected by screening, so this is also an important aspect because the Higgs mode does not carry any charge, so Coulomb screening is not going to affect it. And uh, this naturally explains the spectral rate transfer between the two. So you can actually uh, do a more uh, uh, microscopic calculation, not just of the phonon spectral function, but actually on the total Raman response. Uh, this was done by uh, Che and Ben Fato. So this is really uh, co calculating this kind of, uh, of diagrams where you have the, this would be the Raman, uh, the regular electronic Raman bubble that I showed you in the first lecture, and that would couple to the CDW phonon. And this CDW phonon will in turn, co in turn couple to the, to the Higgs mode. And if you do that, uh, what you see is that indeed, uh, once you cross TC, there is a spectral wave transfer between the CDW phonon and the, and the Higgs mode below TC. And this matches quite well uh, the experiment uh, that is observed in IBM Nicelena. Now, uh, I should say that, and this is something that was sort of overlooked um, since quite recently, and that goes back to the, to the coupling, to the nonlinear coupling I explained you in one of the first slides. So I showed you that actually there is a coupling that is possible to A square term, and you may say, well, Raman, after all, is a two photon process, so why don't we see it directly? And it's actually not a stupid question. Actually, you can ask yourself, well, what if I just get rid of the charge on C wave mode and I try to couple it directly? Then I would have this kind of diagrams. And then I can show that uh, my Raman response will involve a first term here, which I label K chi zero. This is the regular pair breaking term. So this is the one that is giving me uh, a sharp peak at two delta and the continuum. 
And if I do, uh, if I insert the Higgs mode here, I will have an additional term. So if you want, this term will be in the density channel, so tau three in terms of poly matrices. And this one will be in the pairing channel, tau one. And what you can see is that here in the numerator, this has this form. And usually, so gamma k is the Raman vertex, essentially, this coupling between light and, and electrons. And in the literature, and in particular, if you look at Varma's paper, he would take this essentially as a constant, k independent. And because of particle hole symmetry, actually, because there is only epsilon k here, this vanishes. But you can really clearly see that as soon as you put some k dependence in the Raman vertex, there is no reason for this to vanish. So actually, and this is, I think, that was something that was overlooked. Actually, this, the direct coupling, not even thinking about Charles and CD waveform, is actually finite. Now, the question is how big it is. Now, actually, it's, uh, it's a little bit, in the case of uh, niobium dicyanide, it's a little bit smaller, but not that small. So that actually, uh, what you can see is that in the dotted lines here, this is the, the discontribution here. And this uh, can be enhanced, actually, uh, if you gap out part of the Fermi surface, this can become more long-lived, and this can gain a lot in strength. So that actually the direct coupling mechanism is not a stupid idea and could actually work. Now, of course, um, in the case of niobium diselenai, such a direct coupling mechanism would not explain the spectral rate transfer between the Charles and CD wave phonon and the superconducting peak, at least not as easily as in the Varma model. So, but still, it's not completely out of the question that we can see this Higgs mode in a, just a regular superconductor. Yes. So in, the, in, this, in, the, in, the dotted line, in this uh, picture, it's at 2 delta. Yeah. So the way it becomes more long-lived is because you have CDW gap that gaps out part of the Fermi surface, and that gives it more long -lived. But it's still at 2 delta, no. No, no, for this you need to have the CDW phase. Okay, so let me, so let's say that the spectral rate transfer favors the phononic scenario, and I'm going to show you experiment and the hydrostatic pressure, which also, I think, uh, lay credit also to this phononic scenario. So the idea is that actually the, um, the phase diagram of this compound, 2H niobium diselenide, is interesting under pressure. What you have when you apply hydrostatic pressure is that you have essentially a suppression of your charge on CD wave state. But the superconducting st transition temperature is actually very weakly uh, pressure dependent. So by applying pressure, you can actually heal your CDW state and preserve essentially your superconducting state. So this is a key test if you want for this scenario in a way that let's see if really CDW state is crucial or not for the observation of this peak. So this is Raman measurement uh, as a function of, uh, of, of pressure. First, uh, showing the data above TC. So essentially here doing a horizontal line above TC. And this is tracking the pressure evolution of this amplitude mode of the charge on CD wave phase. And here I'm showing you experiment in two different uh, polarization configuration. And in both polarization configuration, you can see that the peak of the amplitude mode of the CDW state indeed vanishes, and that by the time you reach 4 GPA, it's essentially absent. So you have killed, really, the charge on CD wave state. Now, what happens when you cool down through TC? So this is above and below TC at selected pressures. So what you see is that up to 3.2 GPA, you still have the emergence of this relatively sharp peak uh, at low frequency in the superconducting state. Um, there is still a tr transfer of spectral rate. And what you can see is that once you move out of the coexistence between superconductivity and charge on CD wave, so at 4.4 GPA, uh, instead of a relatively sharp peak, you have a broader uh, signal. And importantly, and I'm going to show you that in the next slide, this signal here, which I reproduce here, is located at a higher energy. Yes. as a function of magnetic field, uh, pressure. Yeah, the, okay, so of course, uh, you, you would need an independent measurement of the superconducting gap for that. But the Higgs mode, if you look at this sharp mode here, it softens. 
as a function of pressure. Much, yeah. TC is flat, so presumably, yeah, doesn't change much by 10% at most. Well, this, uh, this can be explained by the fact that, um, okay, so there is one way of explaining it, which cannot be unique, is as you kill, as you kill uh, the charge on CD wave state, the amplitude mode of the charge on CD wave state becomes closer and closer to the gap. Yeah. And this pushes down, and this pushes down the gap to lower frequency. And this pushes down the gap to lower frequency. No. If they are exactly degenerate, actually, it, it's, uh, it's often completely to zero, I think, in Varma theory. Yes. Yes. No. At first, actually, uh, it's 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 non-monotonic. At first, it moves closer. So, see, it, it's a balance between the energy of the amplitude mode and two delta. And I think once they get closer, actually, it gets it gets pushed to lower and lower frequency, and it, it gets to higher frequency only when it goes on the other side. I think that's that that would be the picture of the of the Varma theory. Okay, but the key. I think the key observation here is a, is a summarize in, in this in this in this spectra. Yes. So here, so in this scenario, the pair breaking peak is this one, right? In the red, the red spectra here are the spectra taken outside the coexistence region, right? So at high pressure. So this is above TC and below TC. This is this small thing, and once you enter. The coexistence region, what you see is that you have a sharp peak, and this sharp peak is below to delta. Right? Here. And it's much sharper, and it's clearly not, we are not clearly not talking about the same feature as here. And the, remember, the TC is almost equivalent in both states. Yes? Yes. Yes. What about two delta? Well, two delta apparently is what's remaining here. So it's, it's essentially hidden on the high energy side of the Higgs mode. It's overwhelmed by the spectral weight of the Higgs mode, at least in this picture. Yeah. Yeah. It's, But uh, you have a good question. Again, there, are, there is another compound. Okay, I could show you the data where we can actually boost to delta on the Higgs mode. But in the case of niobium dicyanide, we only see sharply one mode. And it's located below two delta. So there is a simultaneous collapse of the Higgs mode and CDW order. So if we identify the Higgs mode here as a sharp feature, clearly it, it has collapsed, while there is little uh, change in TC. So this is, again, in relatively good agreement with the fact that CDW phase is crucial in bringing uh, this uh, very sharp peak in the coexistence region. Now, this can be actually compared uh, with, uh, with theoretical calculations. So these are theoretical calculations performed by, uh, by Lara Benfato and co-workers, essentially uh, taking the, the, the Littlewood and Varma theory. And, and what they can see is that once you are in the coexistence phase, you have a transfer of spectral weight from the, A of, of, from the amplitude mode of the charge on CD wave state to the Higgs mode. And so once you enter the pure superconducting phase, what is remaining is just a weak uh, two delta pair breaking feature. So this, at least qualitatively, uh, uh, matches the, the data. OK, so now let me uh, move on to uh, something uh, that is uh, somewhat different. but. The motivation is, okay, so we see that, okay, we have at least some good evidence that the Higgs mode can be visible via Raman scattering in a 
compounds where you have superconductivity and Charles and C wave order. I have already told you that there is some kind of warning sign that you could actually get direct coupling. It's not completely out of the question. So the question is whether you can uh, use other techniques to couple to uh, the Higgs mode via this A square term, right? So that, that is going to be a nonlinear technique. And now I'm going to show you so experiment that, uh, that were done in the group of Ryo Shimano. So I had the chance to spend one year uh, in this group. And I'm going to show you a bit of uh, kind of another approach uh, uh, to, see, to see the Higgs mode using terahertz light. So uh, to see that, uh, it's interesting to go back a bit uh, um, um, back in time and, and look at uh, uh, some series paper that were addressing uh, a sort of a different uh, setting in which you would have a superconducting condensate state or a superfluid state and where you would quench the interaction. So for example, suddenly increase uh, the interaction and then follow uh, the dynamic of the, of the superconducting order parameter. So this was done, for example, by, by, this, by these people. So uh, they essentially non-adiabatically changed the pairing uh, interaction. And what they see is that they see an oscillation. The system oscillates between the superfluid and the normal state. That's what they say. They see an oscillation of the order parameter. And this oscillation, uh, this inverse of its period, is exactly 2 delta. Is the gap. So it's kind of, if you want, the, the, the analog of the Higgs mode I just described, but this time, not in the frequency domain, uh, but in the time domain. So in the, in the non-adiabatic regime, you can have access, actually, to these dynamics. Uh, in principle, if you want to follow the receipt of this theory paper, you would need to find a way to quench your uh, pairing interaction. So of course, this is something that can be done theoretically relatively easily. Experimentally, this is another, another challenge. And if you do that, and in a non-adiabatic non way, you would expect, actually, your uh, gap oscillation. So these people could actually write down an analytical uh, formula for the oscillation of the gap within the BCS uh, framework. And what you can see is that, indeed, you have a cosine uh, 2 delta t over h bar oscillation. And there is a square root of t uh, 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 decay that is essentially due to the Landau damping, uh, to the fact that 2 delta is sitting right at the border of the electron hole continuum. And this is what is giving this 1 over square root of t decay. Yeah, so the, there are different settings. So this is actually, this is a. OK, I won't go to the details. I'm not an expert of this kind of calculation. But actually, the, the dynamics depends very much on how you actually prepare your state, whether you quench it down or you're quenching up. And the dynamics are, are quite different. So here, in that case, I think what they started is by reducing by half the pairing interaction. So the initial time was reducing by half the pairing interaction. And then let's see and see the, how the system evolves. So now you can actually try to compute uh, something that may be a little bit more realistic in terms of condensed matter systems. You can try to compute uh, the response of a, super, of a BCS superconductor after an optical quench. So you shine a very short pulse on the superconductor, and then you see how it evolves. So this was calculated by these people. And what you see is that uh, 2 delta, so the initially the superconducting gap decreases. So this can be uh, explained by the fact that you are creating uh, particle hole excitations uh, in a non-adiabatic way. So this is reducing a little bit uh, your superconducting amplitude. And what you see is that for sufficiently short uh, pulses, so in that case, three picoseconds, three picoseconds, you have oscillations. But if you take a very long pulse, so if you don't satisfy the non-adiabatic uh, conditions, so in that case, the non-adiabatic condition would, have to, would be to have a pulse whose duration is shorter than the inverse of 2 delta, essentially. Uh, you see nothing. So how to, to do that? So this is another way of, uh, of looking at, at, the same, uh, at the same physics. So if you take your Mexican hat potential, you are essentially sending an optical pulse. You are reducing the width of your Mexican hat potential, and then the system starts to evolve uh, around the minimum. This is your, your Higgs mode. So you reduce here your other parameter, and then the, the, the system is going to oscillate around, around the minimum. So there, 
This is a, this, so this kind of settings has been actually discussed uh, uh, even in the 70s in the context of microwave uh, uh, measurements in superconductors. So one way of seeing how you can uh, uh, quench your superconducting gap uh, using, uh, using terahertz light or infrared light near the, the, the gap frequency is by looking at the gap equation. So if you modify uh, the temperature of your, of your if you create uh, quasi-particles out of equilibrium according to the gap equation. This is going to change uh, your, your gap amplitude and this could provide a way of quenching your superconducting system. So essentially creating particle hole excitation, Bogolyubov excitation in a non-adiabatic way. But for that, uh, there is a condition is that the width of the optical pulse has to be shorter than H bar over, over delta. So this can be done, for example, here uh, by shining light uh, that is uh, below the gap. And so with an energy that is slightly below to delta, but a width uh, in time that is uh, shorter than h bar over to delta. So this requires, for typical uh, low TC superconductors, this requires a pulse which are in the millivolt uh, energy range, so those are terahertz region, and which have picosecond duration. So this experiment uh, uh, was actually done. So here I'm showing you uh, an experiment done on niobium nitride. So it's a terahertz pump, terahertz probe measurement. So you shine an intense uh, terahertz pulse. So this is the, 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 spectral, uh, um, the, spect the spectrum of this, uh, of this terahertz uh, uh, pulse. So it's roughly centered about one terahertz. So one terahertz is roughly uh, three millivolt. And this is essentially a single cycle uh, uh, pulse in, in the time domain. So typical width is about one picosecond. And what you are going to do is you are going to pump your system with this. And then you are going to see uh, its evolution with time by sending another probe pulse that is going to be also in the terahertz range to probe the dynamics of your superconducting uh, uh, so this is, this is the measurements uh, that was performed. So uh, this is uh, the transmitted electric field in the terahertz range. So remember that uh, in, a super, in a BCS superconductor, if you are shining light at an energy that is below to delta, uh, there, is nothing, there is no transmission. So if you have a reduction of superfluid density or a reduction of two delta, you're going to have a modulation of your transmission. And this is what is observed here. So right immediately after uh, the, 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 the pump, there is uh, an increase of the transmission. So this increase of the transmission can be interpreted as a reduction of the gap. So you are killing a little bit uh, your superconducting gap. And then you can see oscillations. The oscillations are particularly visible here at low fluence when you exert a pump that is not too intense. If you exert a pump, a pump that is too intense, uh, they are essentially uh, damped. And you can extract the, the, the frequency of these oscillations. And the frequency of these oscillations at low pump intensity matches very well twice the gap energy that is measured uh, independently by equilibrium transmission measurements. So you have time domain oscillations uh, of your transmitted electric field that have a frequency of exactly two delta. Uh, now, it's interesting to compare, yes. <laughs> okay, I'm going, <clears throat> I'm going to come back to that later on. So, right now, if you think about the, this uh, quench, uh, uh, this theoretical ideas about quench measurement supercontrols, this really looks like you have realized this quench measurement, right? You, you quench and you see oscillation at two delta. This really matches relatively well. But I'm going to come back to uh, a possible other alternative explanations. Okay, so just uh, to show you, it's interesting to compare uh, the same measurements, but now you don't pump with uh, low energy uh, pulses, or close to, to delta, but you pump at a much higher frequency. So you use visible pulse. For now if you do that, so this is the measurements here on the left, what you see is a large signal, but there are absolutely no oscillations. And the reason is um, 
presumably relatively simple. When you shine 1.5 electron volt light, you are creating a bunch of electron volt excitation very, of very high energy. When they cascade, they break completely your coherence. So there is no hope of finding these two delta oscillations. And for that, you really need to, to, to use a low frequency uh, light. So there is a loss of coherence when you, you pump with too high energy. Now, there is something that is uh, interesting is, so up to now, I have focused to a regime here where you see oscillations that persist uh, when the pump is off. So if you want free oscillations. Now, you can be interested also is what is going on actually uh, when both pump and probe overlap. And here, this is a, a, a kind of a zoom. You can zoom on the, in this region here. So this is the waveform of the pump. And this is the signal of the, of the probe. And what you can see, actually, is that the probe seems to follow not the electric field of the pump, the square of it. So if you look, this minima here corresponds to this maxima here. This maxima corresponds to this maxima. So it looks like when both pump and probe overlap, uh, there is a signal in the probe that is, is following E square. So you can actually uh, see that uh, more nicely if instead of using essentially a single cycle uh, terahertz waveform, but now you shine a multi-cycle waveform. So of, now you use, for example, a narrow bandpass filter. You narrow down in frequency your pulse. Of course, you broaden it in the time domain, and this time you have many oscillations. And if you do that, you see that you see really clearly these oscillations in the probe signal, and these oscillations are really nicely following the, the square of the pump. So, in, so people who do nonlinear optics, they know that. They, they, they immediately say, ah, this is a third order signal. So, um, so this kind of response that follows E square in the language of nonlinear optics is considered as a third order nonlinearity. And by the way, this is also how these people in nonlinear optics describe Raman, also as a third order susceptibility tensor. So I'm going to come back a little bit because this is not the way we in the condensed matter community are used to, to think about it. But for now, let's say that there is a signal that follows E square. So this actually is interesting, you can do a much simpler measurement, and these guys this, did these simpler measurements. You can say, okay, so there is an E square uh, uh, signal, so I'm shining uh, E, and I collect some E square signal, and actually there is another third order nonlinearity that is much simpler, it's third harmonic generation. I shine omega, and I look at a signal at three omega. This is also a third order uh, nonlinear susceptibility. So you can do that. You can do not a pump probe signal, but really just a very simple nonlinear optic measurement. You shine a terahertz light, and you look at its frequency domain uh, composition upon uh, passing through the sample. And what you see is that indeed, so the key curve I think is here, is that you have the fundamental here located right below one terahertz. And when you cool down below TC, there is indeed a harmonic of this fundamental here at 3 omega that is only seen uh, below to delta. And this, the intensity of these harmonics follow uh, the sixth power of the pump, which is also what is expected for a third order nonlinearity. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. So this is omega here, and this is 3 omega. So it's third harmonic generation. No, second harmonic generation. This is sir, yeah. So second harmonic generation is only active when you have uh, a material where inversion symmetry is broken. So it's a well-known tool to study, for example, ferro electricity. And third harmonic generation is, in principle, always possible. It's just that most of the time it's weak. So here, actually, it's a sizable signal. And it's only activated in the superconducting state. So, um, so the, actually, the theory of this effect uh, was, uh, was worked out by Tsuji and Aoki. And what they show that if you use the Anderson uh, pseudo-spin uh, formalism, you can actually compute the nonlinear current. And they show that the third order nonlinear current uh, is actually directly linked uh, to the oscillation of the amplitude of the gap. And importantly, this oscillation of the gap is resonant when 
the frequency of the incoming light omega is exactly equal to delta. So you shine light at delta, and you collect light at 3 delta. So in fact, if you think about it, it's exactly like a Raman process, right? You shine light at delta, you collect light at, two de at 3 delta. So if I were a Raman guy, I would say, OK, so I'm now going to plot everything in terms of Raman shift. So 3 delta minus delta, 2 delta, oh, it's my 2 delta peak. OK, but then you are going to say me, wait, could this be the pair breaking peak there? I will come back to, to that in, in a moment. So anyway, so you expect a, re, uh, a resonance signal when exactly you are matching uh, the omega equal delta condition. So, um, so it's difficult actually to do these measurements uh, at uh, continuously tu tunable uh, frequencies. So what these people did is actually they uh, tune the gap frequency by tuning the temperature. So if you assume that the gap frequency follows BCS temperature dependence, this is one way of, uh, of, of uh, tuning the, the gap amplitude. And what they show is that, indeed, um, the temperature at which the signal is resonant seems to match at different frequencies the temperature at which you would expect omega to match delta if it was to follow a BCS temperature dependence. <coughs> OK. So, so far, so good. Um, we have seen sort of two manifestations of a two delta mode. One in the time domain in the form of some form of transient response that was oscillating at 2 delta. And another one, which was sort of a forced oscillation, if you want, but that seemed to be linked directly to some kind of nonlinear uh, optical susceptibility. And both of them are at 2 delta. So actually, uh, once you, you see this and you know a little bit about Raman, uh, there is, an, of course, an alternative explanation, at least to this kind of measurements. I think it's a bit less obvious about the, the transient measurement in the time domain. But at least for the third harmonic generation, um, uh, there is an obvious alternative, which is that it is the pair breaking peak. And actually, these people, Tsuji and Aoki, when they computed uh, the third harmonic uh, generation, uh, response, they uh, worked out in, a, in an approximation where the pair breaking peak was zero. And this is because they took essentially constant uh, vertices, so it screened out. But of course, uh, we know from Raman's scattering uh, uh, point of view that this is a special case. And in fact, if you don't take this uh, special case and you take a very general a calculation that was done by Chia and Benfato, you realize that indeed, uh, once you compute the third order uh, nonlinear susceptibility, so this third harmonic generation, so this is a, essentially the same diagram as in Raman, except that the incoming frequencies are, are slightly different, but it's essentially the same diagram as with Raman. So you have this uh, first diagram here, which is the one that is known uh, from Raman scattering, and that is going to give you, ba give you the pair breaking peak energy, and then you have the, these other diagrams here, which are essentially this direct coupling to the Higgs that I was uh, talking to you before. Yes. <coughs> no. When I no, it, it, it's a pole, I think. Yeah, it, it's at the bo it's kind of a borderline case. It's it's really yeah, at the border of the continuum. Yeah. Okay, so and if you do that, um, you you realize that gener generically, this contribution is actually several orders of magnitude smaller than the pair breaking contribution. So this is essentially the intensity as a function of omega. Now, the, the bad part of it is that actually both contributions are resonance at delta, delta to 3 delta, of course, because we know from Raman that uh, we have to be, have a mode at, uh, at 2 delta. But both of them are resonant at the same frequency, but one of them is at least three orders of magnitude smaller, so that the D6 contribution is actually much smaller generically in the BCS approximation as this one. 
Now, there is one way uh, to distinguish between the two, which is in the polarization dependence. So in fact, if you take just a very simple model, uh, square lattice with nearest neighbor and the hopping, you can actually uh, compute the polarization dependence of the signal. And what you realize is that the Higgs mode contribution is essentially independent of the angle of the incoming light uh, to the, with respect to the, to the axis. Whereas the pair breaking uh, contribution actually is very strongly dependent on your incoming uh, uh, polarization. And this we know, we know for example from Raman scattering uh, calculation that indeed uh, such a response is going to depend very much on the kind of uh, light polarization that, that you use. So in the case of uh, just a tight binding model with only nearest neighbor hopping, actually the pair breaking uh, contribution vanishes when you excite at 45 degrees uh, of the axis, whereas the Higgs contribution is completely isotropic. So this, is, so this tells you that, okay, maybe there is a way to disentangle these two contributions looking at the polarization dependence of the signal. And if you do that, and this is sort of the puzzle, uh, so you can do that in niobium nitride, and what you see, to make a story short, is that the third harmonic generation signal is essentially independent of polarization. Completely within few percent. You, you hardly detect any, any polarization dependence. And this is the puzzle because it's, it's very hard for any generic system to have the pair breaking contribution be so independent of polarization orientation. And only the Higgs mode actually uh, guarantees you that. So this is the puzzle. Um, in the BCS approximation, you would expect the Higgs contribution to be orders of magnitude weaker, but yet in the experiment, it seemed to be the relevant one for, for these measurements. So I think there is still no uh, good explanation uh, for, into what, for what reason uh, the Higgs mode apparently seemed to dominate these measurements. So there was uh, some attempt to go beyond the BCS approximation by including retardation effect by coupling to some uh, phonon mode. And these measurements show that if you include retardation, uh, you bring the contribution from the Higgs mode uh, a bit closer to what you would expect uh, from the pair breaking mode. But I think right now this is a bit uh, still speculative. Okay, so in the remaining part of, uh, of, uh, of this uh, second lecture. Let me now uh, talk about some recent measurement uh, we did in collaboration with the group of Ryo Shimano in Japan. Yes? Yes. Yeah. In the, BC, in the BCS approximation, yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really puzzling, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that is the puzzle, yeah. yeah. And, if, it, and if, it's, if it's correct, then it sort of also would be a, a main drive to sort of reconsider also Raman scattering measurements in superconductor, right? So this, it, it brings a lot of, uh, of a question about this, yeah. Okay, so. Um, now, what happens if you, so up to now I discussed about S-wave superconductors. Now you have nitride is an S-wave superconductor. Uh, it's not as simple as that because it's a multiband S-wave superconductor, but still, okay, we think we reasonably understand uh, this superconductor. So now let me uh, briefly uh, uh, talk to you about what's going on in D-wave. Okay, so in D-wave, uh, the amplitude mode would correspond to an homogeneous uh, oscillation of the D-wave gap amplitude. So that would be this form. Now it was argued by uh, Barlas and Varma that you could have actually oscillations that break the lattice symmetry. But here, let me for now just consider only the conventional Higgs mode in the sense that it's in the A1G symmetry. So it's modulating the gap in a way that it does not break lattice symmetry. Now, what are the challenges in, in probing this, uh, this Higgs mode um, for a D wave? Uh, 
Uh, well, the first thing is that, as we discussed, uh, in general, it's damped, and in the D-wave superconductor, in, and in the D-wave superconductor, it's even worse, because here uh, we have plenty of low energy excitation because there are nodes, so you would expect the damping to be even more dramatic than in the case of an S-wave. Um, so this was uh, calculated uh, by Peronacci and co-workers um, using a quench setup, so similar to the setup I, I showed you before, essentially quenching uh, the pairing interaction and seeing how it evolves. And in the dotted line, this is the case of S-wave. And in the red line, this is D-wave, and you see immediately that the damping in the case of D-wave is, as expected, much faster than in the case of, of the S-wave superconductor. So that's one challenge. In the terms of a transient dynamics, you would, ex you would expect this two delta oscillation to be much more short-lived. Now, there are other challenges, uh, but they are more technical. So first, it's a bit more difficult to produce um, intense pulse in the spectral range of delta for high TC cube rates, for example. So the delta, the superconducting gap in high TC cube rates is in, in several tenths of millivolt, and it's a bit, bit harder to produce intense pulse in this energy range. So in other words, the resonance condition is harder to, to fulfill. And of course, uh, the equivalent of that is that um, in terms of reaching non-adiapaticity, uh, it requires really ultra-short pulse, uh, sub-100 femtosecond pulse, if you want to reach the non-adiapaticity. And this is quite challenging. So what I'm going to show you is a, a first uh, attempt to, to measure this physics, but um, I'm going to focus uh, on essentially probing not this transient oscillation uh, after uh, quench or non-adiabatic excitation of your superconductor, but looking more at this third order nonlinear response that I've been discussing in the context of third harmonic generation. So the, the setup is the following. So we are working on crystals. So the, the setup that I showed you where we were looking uh, uh, at the transmission measurements was on, on thin films. So of course on crystals, uh, uh, on, those are bulk uh, materials, so you cannot really transmit uh, uh, your terahertz wave. So what we did is actually to use a setup where you pump with terahertz, but you are going to look at your nonlinear response by probing its effect on the optical reflectivity, so high energy uh, uh, response. So this is the form of the, of the terahertz electric field. So it's a relatively high, so it's about one order of magnitude higher in electric field than the experiment on niobium nitride, so because TC is much higher. So you really need a much stronger pulse to really affect your superconducting state. And this is centered as 0.6 terahertz, so about one millivolt. So clearly we are in the non-resonant regime. So if you look at the, the theoretical calculation where you see the resonance signal of the third harmonic generation peaking at delta, here we are really on the tail of it. So we are in the non-resonant regime. So this is, so what we did is that uh, one nice thing about using optical probe in refractivity configuration is that you can actually uh, tune your, uh, your light polarization so you can actually quite easily uh, look at the response as a function of orientation of polarization with respect to the crystallographic axis. So this is experiment on bismuth 2212. So uh, change in refractivity as a function of time. In red here, this is E square of the terahertz pump. And what you see here in blue and red are the change in optical reflectivity in two different configuration polarization. One where the probe uh, electric field and the terahertz electric field are parallel. And the other one where both are perpendicular. <coughs> so essentially, I keep my terahertz electric field along the same direction, but I rotate by 90 degrees my probe uh, electric field. So what you see is that in both polarization, you can see a signal, and this signal follows uh, the square of the pump. You can actually uh, probe for a given configuration. You can plot as a function of temperature, and what you see is that this E square signal indeed uh, shoots up uh, below TC, so it's really associated to, to the superconducting state. Um, now, uh, this kind of... Um, of third order signal is actually, so you heard about the, the Kerr effect in the, in the previous talk, but actually, uh, historically, the Kerr effect is defined not in a way that was uh, uh, talked about by uh, Aaron Kapitulnik. In fact, if you look at Optics book, the Kerr effect more rigorously is a change in, in the optical uh, constant that are 
intent that depends on the light intensity. So the, if you look at your uh, equation, uh, your optics equation, you have the indice, the, the optical index, and the optical index is uh, to linear order independent of the electric field. Now, if you go to the next order, the next order is actually a change of the optical index that goes as E squared for inversion symmetric materials. And essentially, the effect that we are seeing here is a change in the optical index upon, upon irradiating the sample via, via a terahertz electric field. So it's a change of optical index upon uh, impacting it with a terahertz electric field. So this goes as E squared. So it's a change of the optical index upon terahertz pump. So it should, it should follow E squared scaling. And you see here that indeed it follows uh, E squared of the pump. And more uh, generally, you can, you can show that uh, the change in optical uh, uh, refractivity will depend on the third rank tensor uh, that is written here, chi A, J, K, L, and that is going to be uh, depend on the E squared of the pump. So just, so just like you did this game of uh, extracting the symmetry component of this tensor in the case of Raman measurements, you can actually extract irreducible representation of this tensor using light polarization. And you can actually decompose here your uh, third order tensor. You will have an A1G term that is going to be essentially independent of the light polarization. There is going to be a B1G term that is going to go as cosine two theta of the pump and cosine two theta of the probe. And there is going to be a B2G term that is going to scale as sine two theta. So very similar to the to the decomposition that I showed you for Raman scattering. And what you see here is the angular dependence of the signal uh, by fixing the pump and varying only the probe. And what you can see is that there is a constant term, and there is an, a term that is also oscillating, and is oscillating as cosine to theta. Now, you can actually extract all the components, and what you see is that the signal, the terahertz curve signal, is dominantly A1G. This is this isotropic component. And there is a subdominant component here in green that goes at cosine to theta. So there is a subdominant B1G component. Yes? Yeah, I'm pretty much finished. Yeah. So what we did is we did essentially the depth dependence of this feature. And uh, this terahertz curve effect that becomes activated in the superconducting state, in the superconducting state is essentially visible in all dopings. And in all dopings, uh, it is A1G dominant. Actually, there is an interesting uh, doping dependence. So if you plot the ratio of the B1G to the A1G uh, component, so essentially the B1G component is negligible for underdoped sample. But they become of the same order for overdoped sample. But throughout the doping range, the A1G component is always dominant. Now, you can actually look at diagrams to explain this, uh, this uh, third order uh, nonlinear response. Uh, they are essentially Raman-like diagrams, um, but there are more. So for example, in Raman-like diagrams, you would have this kind of diagrams, but when you do pump and probe, you can have such diagrams, for example, where small omega is the optical probe and capital omega is the optical pump. And actually, in the non-resonant regime, this is this kind of diagrams that, that dominates. And you can compute the contribution of this diagram both to the pair breaking channel and to the Higgs channel. And what you can see is that generically, again, the Higgs mode will only appear in A1G channel. While the pair breaking peak, or the charge density fluctuation uh, contribution, if you want, uh, will be predominantly B1G channel. And this is actually what is observed in Raman measurement in cuprates. In Raman measurement in cuprates, um, the dominant contribution is in the B1G channel, the one that is probing the maximum of the superconducting gap. But in this kind of uh, measurements, this is uh, different. It's dominated by, by the A1G channel. So the tentative uh, interpretation is that the A1G contribution is essentially coming from the D-wave fix uh, contribution. And the B1G uh, component likely comes from this pair breaking uh, contribution that dominates the Raman spectrum. So I'm going to end up here. So 
Um, of course, uh, this is by no way the last word. I think it, it's still very puzzling uh, why it seems that the Higgs contribution is dominant in, uh, in these superconductors, while BCS uh, calculation would expect a strongly subdominant contribution. I think it's still an open question. And uh, beyond that, it's also an open question why these measurements seem to yield symmetry dependence that are very different than Raman because after all, they seem to be controlled by the same kind of response function. So I think this is a sort of a novel way also to probe uh, a superconducting state. And uh, this also brings uh, additional questions as to what are we actually probing uh, with these measurements. And with this, uh, I will conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you.